I didn't know I did all those things. <laughs> but this is great, and I thank uh, the organization, and thank you, Mark, for your kind words. This is my favorite color. It's very heavy. I hope I can get it back over the border before the wall goes up. <laughs> Are you trying to keep it down? So, what do I do here? I go forward. Okay. So, this is the title of my talk. The important part is the part in brackets. Uh, when I was packing my bag to come here, I looked at the internet to find out what the weather forecast was going to be and found out that it was going to be 95 degrees every day or more. So I decided not to pack a shirt and tie and jacket, but that's what I look like if I wear a shirt and tie and jacket. <laughs> this is my conflict of inter perceived conflict of interest slide. And you can see that there's many different companies on this slide. But we have, what we have found over the years is that to avoid conflict of interest, you should really work with everyone. <laughs> and you'll notice that there's room in the bottom right-hand slide of this slide for another bullet. <laughs> so if there are any companies, representatives in the audience who aren't on the slide, we can talk about it later. Well, in 1981, I attended the first uh, STD World Congress in Puerto Rico. And I ended up being on the program with Julia Schachter. For those of you who don't know what Julia Schachter looked like in 1981, <laughs> he's the guy with the dark glasses on. And Julie talked me into uh, doing some research with chlamydia. So I went home and I uh, made, a, uh, made up a diagnostic laboratory for the diagnosis of chlamydia infections, learned how to do cell cultures, etc. And in 1986, this was the first publication we uh, had in the Journal of Infectious Diseases showing the detection of chlamydia antigens by using commercial tests such as enzyme immunoassay and immunofluorescence. That same year, we followed that up with another pa paper shown here in the Journal of Cl uh, Clinical Micro, which was a serology paper showing the ac accuracy of immunoglobulin M immunoassay for diagnosis of infections in infants and adults, and Julie was a co-author on this paper. So we quickly developed a rationale for our research lab, and we figured that with so many asymptomatic infections with chlamydia, that women without symptoms who were undiagnosed and untreated really ran the risk of upper tract infection with the consequences of pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, or infertility. And that the only way we were going to be able to control these infections was through screening programs. And the only way we're going to be able to do screening programs for asymptomatic patients was to use non-invasive sampling. And that's how it ended up being the how and why to DIY, <laughs> which we're into now in an era of uh, less invasive sampling. So we decided very early on that we would concentrate on the pre-analytical uh, part of testing and try to enhance that um, part of testing. So from 1987 to 1990, we did several studies comparing and improving laboratory techniques. The first study that we did and published using this Chardonnay-looking substance, <laughs> which is called a first catch urine in Europe and a first void urine in North America for some odd reason, uh, what is shown here. This was in the Journal of Infectious Diseases in 1990, where we were able to show the presence of antigens as alternatives to swabs and cultures for diagnosing chlamydia infection. This was followed by another publication in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology looking at men and showing that we could detect antigens in the urine of men as efficiently as you could with urethral swabbing. 
Another uh, article back in the JID uh, journal uh, was in 1991 where we focused in on female testing of urine using antigen tests and compared cervical, urethral, and urine testing. But it wasn't until a few years later when we published our studies that came out of a multi-center trial with the LCX test from Abbott, which was a nucleic acid amplification test, ligase chain reaction, showing in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology in 1994 that one could use this test and be very efficient in diagnosing infections both in men and women. Then this uh, next paper in the Journal of Infectious Diseases focused in on men and showed that it didn't matter whether they had symptoms or didn't have symptoms. It was an efficient way to diagnose urethral infections by testing their urine. And then the Lancet paper, which came out in 1995, first authored by Helen Lee, and the results, the female results of the multi-center trial that people like Julie and the late Walt Stamm and, and our lab uh, were involved with created some media interest, and this is just a clipping out of the Hamilton Spectator in 1995, indicating that this was a painless chlamydia test found in DNA technology, that it was a urine-based test that may lead to better control of disease, and that it was an exciting development and a contribution. So our lab spent uh, the next several years really focusing in on trying to make the whole process uh, better. We wanted to look at urine and we wanted to have as many tests available to us to be tested, to be tested using urine. And this paper, which was in the uh, Clinical Microbiology and Infection Journal in 1998, I think was the first to show that the ligase chain reaction test uh, had some problems with urine as far as urinary inhibitors of amplification were concerned. The second paper uh, was the result of a large study that we did looking at urine from pregnant and non-pregnant women for inhibitors of amplification, uh, not only to ligase chain reaction, but to transcription mediated amplification, which is the gen probe test and the PCR test, which was the Roche test. And we showed that by doing urinary analysis that we could actually identify the inhibitors of amplification in urine and suggested ways of getting rid of them. Another uh, study showed that you could actually get rid of them uh, in the Aptima Combo 2 test by introducing what GenProbe did, and that was a, cap, a target capture system that allowed the target, the DNA or RNA target in this case, to be captured, the urinary inhibitors to be washed away, and then you could make the identifica identification. And then this uh, combination of that phenomenon and the high analytical sensitivity really translated into identified more, identifying more women infected with chlamydia. Well, I'm, I'm from a province in Canada, as you know, and we have universal health care there, which, but we're always conscious about the costs of, of the care and also laboratory testing. So we did uh, some studies looking at uh, the accuracy and the cost of using the ligase chain reaction testing pooling of urine. And there was a session that I was in a little earlier today uh, in uh, still talking about pooling of, of samples. We followed that up with another pooling study in JCM, uh, pooling cervical samples. And what we really found here was that pooling is a good idea. It saves money, but unless the prevalence is low enough to warrant pooling, you don't do it. We published this paper in September of 92 showing the effectiveness and efficiency of selective versus universal screening for chlamydia in sexually active women. And John Sellers was, the late John Sellers was the first author on this paper. And then we conducted a large uh, decision tree analysis to look at the cost effectiveness of screening 
using a swab or urine uh, on different age groups of Canadian women uh, living in Ontario. So, you know, things are really good at this stage, but they always get better. And w by getting better, uh, this illustrates the uh, fact that we all started looking at another less invasive sample than urine, and that is a self-collected vaginal swab. And I don't know who started with this. I think Julie Schachter may have been the first one who really brought the idea up at some point, but somebody did. But many of us has, have worked uh, to look at uh, using this technology or this technique for uh, finding infections in women. And I'm going to uh, reference three papers that we were involved with to illustrate the point. This first one is the Journal of Clinical Microbiology paper in, I guess, the year 2003, entitled Vaginal Swabs Are Appropriate Specimens for the Diagnosis of Chlamydia or Other General Infections. And Julie was the first author on that paper. <clears throat> the second paper is this one where we reported from a clinical trial using the Aptima test that women found it easy and they preferred to collect vaginal samples over urine, believe it or not, to diagnose chlamydia infections. And then the companion paper to that one in the same issue of the STD journal uh, was this one where vaginal swabs are the specimens of choice. Well, here we have urine testing, we have vaginal swab testing, great screening process, but then we also got to thinking that there are other screening programs out there, i.e. screening for cervical cancer. <clears throat> and we started thinking about would we be able to rescue chlamydia or gonorrhea out of the thin liquid-based thin prep vials of the two systems that were available. One, the thin prep system, and the other, the SureFast system. So we looked at that and published several papers showing that it was a successful way to go. You could easily detect chlamydia and gonorrhea uh, by testing SurePath liquid-based specimens in the Aptima test. We also used the Amplicor test and the ProbeTech test from two other companies to show that you could easily rescue chlamydia and Neisseria gonorrhea nucleic acids in preserved site thin prep samples. We validated the Aptima Combo 2 assay from SurePass samples in which the samples had been collected with different collection devices. So that was a validation that this was also a And last but not least, this fourth publication uh, which compared three assays and showed that if you took the sample before the cytology sample or after the cytology sample, you got the same result. And that was an important contribution because you got to think that these samples are going from the patient to the pathology lab. And it bypasses the microbiology lab. And by the time you get it after they've done it, it's a little too late to be getting a result. So <clears throat> one of the other things that came across our minds as we were moving along at a, at a fairly rapid pace of looking at the various tests that were out there commercially was that every package insert you read from, from the trials, the FDA trials, said this assay is good as that assay is as good as that assay. So we wanted to prove is that really the case? And the only way you prove that is by doing a head-to-head -head comparison of the assays, which we did. And the good news is that, for the most part, they are pretty equal, but there are times when they aren't. And I won't get into that because it would take a long time to talk about it. So recently, we've been looking at self-sampling the urinary meatus. And I'm really proud about this drawing because it's a self-portrait <laughs> of my right hand. <laughs> because I'm right-handed. And so there I was trying to draw my right hand and then I would put it up, look at it, and then I would try and draw it. And I wasn't smart enough to take a photograph of my right hand and just draw it. 
anyway, this is, this is sort of a new, newer sample that we're considering for screening men. And so we wanted to find out, is it as good as urine? Because of course you know that urine testing is the recommendation both in the United States and in other parts of the world. A uh, couple of studies, and some of you in the audience also have done it. You haven't got the same results as we have, but that's okay. Uh, this one study that we published in the STI journal, sorry about that, Bill, but we, we sort of had to spread it around. Uh, and this compared self-collected swabs to urinary meatus, or of, of the urinary meatus to, to first catch urine. And it showed that you do, I, we did identify more cases of chlamydia and gonorrhea from the swab of the meatus. And then more recently in the STD journal in 2017, we extended the study into a larger one and looked not only at chlamydia and gonorrhea, but also at uh, mycoplasma and at trichomonas vaginalis. And in each case, the sample from the urinary meatus uh, yielded more positives than the urine sample. So some of my colleagues are now calling the meatal sample the male vagina. I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> but if you compare it to urine testing, you know that uh, vaginal testing always yields more positives than urinary testing. Okay, so with this tremendous increase in sampling that was being taking place, and labs were now getting overloaded with a number of specimens to run in a given day, and so the uh, companies had to really come up with automation. And this just shows five instruments that, from five different companies, a couple of them are fully automated, some are partially automated. And so we, we endeavored to, because these are expensive sample, uh, and a big decision to make when you go into a certain uh, company uh, test, then you want to know more about it. So we published several studies recently, uh, this one in 2014, and we examined workflow and maintenance characteristics of five, five instruments. Then we followed that up with a not only workflow and maintenance, but the, uh, uh, the use of consumables in the plastics and discard information. Things that I never thought I would study, but we felt that it was an important thing to do, so we embarked upon it. And then this last comparison, which compared the Cobos 4800, the M2000, the Viper XTR, and the Infinity 80 uh, for all of these various aspects of processing samples. More recently, we, as Mark has mentioned, we've been uh, moving into the, uh, trying to apply our knowledge into the HPV diagnosis trade. Uh, this was just a study that we published recently showing that you can detect uh, cervical uh, precancerous lesions using the Aptima HPV test use it from SurePath preservative. If you treat the SurePath with proteinase K and heat, you elevate the amount of HPV positives that then are related to CIN2 or CIN3 uh, lesions. We also got involved in a, uh, a large study uh, looking at uh, the use of commercial tests for HPV with uh, oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma and have recently published uh, in, in the journal, two journals, uh, the results of assaying fine needle aspirations from the uh, cervical lymph nodes of patients who have throat cancer. And this last paper, I think, which is a really interesting one, where we were able to show the presence of HPV E6 oncoproteins and messenger RNA for HPV uh, in those samples, which is really a signal of uh, transformation true transformation rather than just having DNA available. Uh, as, as other labs have, uh, we have gotten into the arena of mycoplasma genitalium infection and we presented at the CDC meeting in Atlanta two years ago this data uh, showing uh, rates of MGen 
uh, infection and antibiotic resistance meeting mutations across Canada in each province, and then published it in the STD journal uh, last year. So uh, as uh, was uh, indicated by uh, Stephanie uh, before me, there's always a lot of people involved uh, in your program. And so I'd like to mention that people like Kathy Lewinstra, Sylvia Chong, Jim Mahoney, and the late John Sellers were very instrumental and important in getting uh, my program off the ground. And more recently, Manuel Arias, uh, Merrick Smea, Sam Ratnam, and of course, Danny Chang, who you, many of you know, who has been with me uh, over 30 years, uh, has contributed. Uh, and I couldn't uh, finish by without saying that uh, I have a, I've had a great relationship with almost all the companies out there that I've met and worked with some of the brightest scientists who are found in companies and are a great resource to us. And I would encourage many of you to think about that and try to work with them. And my battery is running low. But that's okay. What do you mean I'm getting older? <laughs> and so they have really gone the extra length to support uh, the 28 projects that I've been talking about, and, and they funded for almost $3 million in U.S. dollars uh, over the past 18 years. So uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the ride. Yeah.